Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. But tonight is my last, as we've been doing thinkers. Are you enjoying that, uh, the series? I am enjoying it. I am enjoying it, and I believe that God is, is doing something in this house. Uh, my husband says he was going to do thinkers until God tells him to stop. And I thought, we are getting all this knowledge, right? We're, we're, we're getting good meat. We're, we're getting fed really, really good because we're teaching you the word of God. You're, I believe that you're getting, you're getting a seven-course meal in this house because it's God's word and because God wants such transformation in your life and in my life. But knowledge is just information. The Bible says that my people have perished without knowledge because we need to know. And so we're giving you the tools. We're giving you everything that you need to know when you bring you the word of God. But wisdom, you know what wisdom is? It's actually you get to experience what you know. So I believe that we're doing now. It's, it's time for us to, as we continue to, to uh, soak in and as we continue to take what the word of God is saying, as you continue to hear what God is saying to this house, because if, if you are in this house and this is your house, God's speaking to you and he's asking you to think greater, to think higher. So if this is your house, God wants us to expand and to move our limitations. That He, We know that He it's limitless, but it's us who put a limit on him. You need to know that we are this this house and every and every person, every every daughter and every son of God. We are saved, but not just to live a comfortable life. It's not just to live a good life. God wants to bless us. That's a given. He wants to prosper us. But everything that He's given us and doing in our lives is so that others can see. Everything that we're learning, He says, go and make disciples. I think it's in. Let me give you my first scripture. It's, it's in um, Mark 16, 15. And he says, and then he told them, this is Jesus, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. You know, we, we are, the church exists um, not just for us to feel good, you know, because it feels great. Didn't you enjoy uh, worship? I love worship. I, I, I enjoy worship, and, I, and God speaks to me during worship, and I can hear God during worship. And, and then he comes, and he does that because he wants you to know that he is actually here, that we can tangibly feel his presence. And even when we do not feel him, he wants you to know that he's still with us. He's still with us. He's never, ever going to leave us. He's never going to abandon us. He will never do that, and he keeps his word. We don't keep our word, but he keeps his word. And he wants us as we continue to, to learn, as we continue to expand our thinking and, and, and think greater things for our lives, he wants us to people to see that we are able to proclaim the goodness of God. He said that to all of, all of, all of the disciples, everyone who follows this, I want you to go into all the world. And many times we don't feel that that's our call because we're not missionaries. I'm not an evangelist, so that doesn't pertain to me. No, 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 it pertains to you. Wherever you go, that's your world. When you go to your workplace, that's your world. When you go shopping, because some people don't work, they just shop. That's your world. Your home, if you stay at home, a mom, a dad, that's your world. Everywhere we go, that's our world. And we are to proclaim. It, says, it means it's a herald, someone who proclaims good news. But then I thought, Lord, are we proclaiming good news? Is my life reflecting the goodness of God? Or is my, of my life reflecting the conditions of my life and the problems of my life? And, or is my life is still, is still proclaiming? What is going around the world? Is my life still proclaiming that I'm Hispanic? Is my life still proclaiming that I am limited in my thinking? What are we proclaiming? What are we portraying? What are we representing? God says, you're my representative and your life needs to prove that I am good. God wants us to walk in great power. 
He wants us to recognize that there is nothing, there is nothing, and I say that to my sister Virginia, there is nothing impossible with God if you believe. You know, as I was coming in, I, 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 I was just thanking God, and I was like, wow, Lord, this December we're going to be 21 years old walking with God. That's awesome. And then I remember, you know, when, when, when you start and, you know, remember when you fall in love with Jesus. It's like marriage. We're supposed, it's marriage. Like he says, you, your life is actually my love for you and, and your love for me is going to reflect the, the way I feel about that church. That's what Jesus said. And when you're in love, you, you believe everything and you ask for things. And, and as I was coming, my, my, my brother Kiki gave me a word. And then he said to me, God wants you to remember when you were like, well, the Lord used a word that I know, that word is for me, I'm not going to share it with you. But he says, God, God remembers when you used to come and just ask him for crazy things. Crazy things, you just ask him for things. And he would answer every time. And you know, what he does to me is that God is saying, you, I want you to ask me. I want, it doesn't matter how old you get to be, how many, time, how many years you've been walking with God. He wants you to come and he wants you to believe and he wants you to ask for things that look impossible. I don't know what seems impossible in your life tonight, but he wants you to know that it's possible with him. It's possible. See, the moment that we know that transformation is taking place, when I start seeing things that are impossible, possible. That's a key that we are, we are growing in our thinking. That's the key that we know, like before I used to believe that that was impossible. But now I'm in a different place and I believe that this is possible. So you need to know that God wants you to believe that there's nothing, nothing that he cannot do for you. He loves you. He loves you and he wants us to think higher. He wants us to go higher. And I believe, it's almost picking, I, I, I was preaching Sunday, and I said, God is asking us, I, it's, it's, it, your yes needs to be yes, and your no needs to be no. God is asking you, do you want to change? Do you want to have a different thought? Do you want a new pers perspective in your life? And it's a simple yes or no. Do you know that the gospel of God is simple? It's simple. It's like, it's not complicated. It's the simplest gospel I have ever read. He says, if you're offended, forgive. That's simple, isn't it? It's not complicated. It's difficult, but it's simple. It's simple. We complicate it because it's hard. It's hard to like, yes, I know. We need to go from knowledge and everything that we're getting into experiencing. And now it's time to do what we are learning. Okay, the Bible says that to get my healing, I need to start speaking the word of God. It's so easy to say it, but it's so hard when you are dealing with pain. It's so hard when you're going to the doctors and the doctors is giving you actually a worse report than the, than the report you started. So God is it's asking, I want you to go higher, believe higher. And he wants you to start from this day forward, whenever he asks us something, he says, I want, I, I want them to be a yes or a no. You know that he's okay when we say no to him? Because he has given us a free will. Matthew 5.37 says this, just say a simple yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. Because when God asks us yes or no, because if we start justifying, have you ever done something that you, you know you did wrong, but you just want to justify it really bad? I flipped them while I was driving. I took up the, you know, the finger that is forbidden. I'm not saying that I did that. But I've seen people do it. People that have the Lord. 
but they would justify it because they were cut off. We, we, we are so good at justifying, at making excuses and why no or yes. And God's saying, get rid of all the limitations, get rid of all the excuses and just answer me yes or no. And when we agree with God, he will move on our behalf. He wants to move on our behalf. He doesn't want us stuck. He It's ready for us to go. And I believe there was a, a time that Paul, I want you to go to Ephesians 1, 18 and 19. And even Paul was praying for the church of Ephesus. And he's saying, I want this church, I want the people of God to open their minds to see what God is doing. This is what it says. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. There is incomparable great power for those who believe. It's not for the ones who don't believe. It's for those who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength who exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. I don't know about you, but change is really hard. Do you agree with me? But I am very grateful that in this church, our DNA is change. If you've been with us from day one and to now, seven years, we're about to celebrate seven years next month, you know that there is change constantly taking place in this house. And why wouldn't we continue to change? Because God is constantly, constantly asking us to change. He's so creative. God is a God that who's moving forward. God is a God who is more than enough. God is a God who has no limitations. God is a God that wants us to believe for crazy things. I know for a fact that this house exists because my husband has chosen to believe God for crazy things. Crazy things. He said, I want, I remember years ago, I don't know, it was a year ago. He said, I want, I want this to be redone. I want when people come, I want them to experience the presence of God. I want something beautiful for the people. When they come, they, they know that this is a house of excellence. And then I'm like, okay, but where are the finances? But see, one thing, you need to be around people that do not limit God because you don't have finances. And these are just pallets. Says, well, let's get a bunch of pallets and we and we stain them and we paint them and 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 then there is no one thing that I have learned has been really hard for me is to get rid of all of those why nots. Get rid of it. Why not? I don't think this is gonna happen. This is impossible. This is not gonna look good. And then when I think about this house, this house is rooted in the change, in transformation that Jesus has done within, within us, and it's, you can see it. If you were here seven years ago, these chairs, the chairs that we used to have, they were painful. Springs were coming out. You could even bring a chair, and then you put it there, and you look taller because the thing was up, you know? It was painful. And then my husband said, we're going to believe for new chairs. Uh, where is the money? You see, many times we don't, God is asking you, I want you to transform it. And, and I never forget that my husband said, when we started this place, he said, God told me that we need to transform this sanctuary. And I was like, God, you talk a lot. <laughs> where is the moolah? Where is the money, God? And you need to know that if you're part of this church, this is good ground. I can say that this is good ground. My husband said, how much do we have? I said, what do you mean, us? Yeah, there's only 30 people, 12 people. So when we counted the offerings, we just found like a bunch of like dollar bills crunched up and a few gums. I was in such a need. I was like, what flavor is this? <laughs> Covered by the blood of Jesus. Well counted. Why am I sharing this? Because see, 
We could have said, no, we don't have it. But the Lord says, what do you have? What do you have? Him, what do you have? Well, you know that year we had one of our best tax returns, and I was super excited. I'm like, yes, we got $7,000. I was like, I'm going to tithe. I'm going to give an offering. And my husband will say, that is going to be to pay the permit to get rid of our septic tank because this house smelled like crap. We can say crap, but literally smell really bad because it was a septic tank. And I was like, but can we believe, can we give 50%? And can we believe that God is going to send people? And my husband said, no, God told me to do it now. And so I want you to know that everything that we preach here is we live it. Are we perfect? No, by any means. But it's about practicing what you're learning. Practicing that our God is a giver. He is generous. He wants transformation. He wants change. We don't want change. I don't want change in many areas of my life. May I be honest? I No, I don't like change. I do it because I love God. And he has to convince me a lot. Like, that's why I have a therapist, the Holy Spirit. Virginia, come on, we can do this. Can we have another session? And he's free. What am I saying all this? Because it's time that we live everything, whoever stands on this pulpit, we're not just preaching, you know, a good message. We're, we're preaching because we live it. He says, go and make disciples. You know, disciples is not just someone who gets, hey, hey, disciple, bring me my water. No, it's not about that. Disciples are learners. Learners. They're not hearers. They hear and they learn. And they and they put it into practice. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all men. So I know that sometimes being part of Elevate is really painful. We hear it from all of our leaders. To come here, someone said, it's like, it's in like medieval times when they're stretching you like. You look, you go like that with the little, you crank it. And then God says, okay, you, you already grew an inch, now we can do another inch. And I just want you to know that God wants you to be, to be so certain that he is with us. That he, you are so certain that he is for you, that he will never leave us, that he, I don't know what you're believing tonight, but he told me during worship, tell them that tonight I am resurrecting dreams. I heard it clearly. He even asked me, what do you want? I was like, me? I want to know what I want. He says, tonight I am giving life where there were things that were fully dead in your life. He said, tell them. Tell them, but is it, I can tell you, but do you receive it and do you believe it? But he is resurrecting dreams. We still have a half, half of the year, and he says that this is the year of victory. This is the year that we walk into our promised land, and so we cannot be afraid. We cannot be afraid. This is someone who all I have known is fear. But you know the, when fear enters our lives, that's the moment the faith walks out. No, no, we, this house, your family, whatever we were believing, I told the Lord, okay, that, that wall, that needs to come down, that we believe. You need to believe tonight. You need to believe. If, if you wrote uh, something on the card, I want you to go back tonight before the service is over. And I want you to go and you, and you have to say, Lord, I'm, I'm saying yes to you. Because sometimes we wrote like, Lord, restore my family. Lord, I, I want a promotion. Lord, I want a new career. But we're one, we want God to do everything. I want to be restored, but I'm waiting for, for my children. Or you're waiting on your spouse to change. Or you're waiting for your boss to change, to be nice. You're waiting for someone to offer you a promotion. How about you work for that promotion? How about you said, you know what, I'm not going to let me, my God, I'm going to do my best. If, we, if you clean homes, then clean, be the best cleaner. 
If you flip burgers, be the best burger flipper. Is that how you call it? Or flipper, burger, whatever. Just be the best. Where people, are, where people, I tell Isaac, because you just got a new job. Isaac, I said, you need to make yourself indispensable in that place. Oh, but that's not part of my job. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> because that's how we are. And we're living in times that we, you crave it. And I understand we want roles and responsibilities. If I don't see my role that, you know, they haven't given me, I don't know. I'm just going to do whatever is needed. This is just what all I have to do is go outside, get that shopping cart, put groceries. I said, hey, if you see a spill, you clean it. Clean it. We want all these things that God has for us, but we're waiting. You're wasting time if you're praying for your boss. Lord, let my boss see how awesome I am. And God is saying, how about you? Go and be awesome. How about you go and work really hard? Where they see like, oh my gosh, we can't. There's no way. We have seen people that start as serving in the house of God or wherever, a job. And they made themselves. And these people are legit. They love God. They're not. Because sometimes we're like, God has put me in this place to be such a witness. And we take our Bible. And we take our stickers. And we take crosses in our cubicle. Have you met those people? And then in their cubicle, it's like you have all these crosses with their holy water or like, you know, holy oil, anointing oil. But they only do what's required of them. They never do more than enough, like for the company. They never go the extra mile. But then you're expecting such a promotion. And then we get mad at God because he's not opening doors. And God is like, I actually, the door is open, but you're not walking through it. It's like, Laura, I want a promotion. Tomorrow when I go to work, I think that my boss is going to see. And when my boss sees me, let him see an angel. <laughs> let him see such a reflection of light. Let him see how soft I am. I am the hope of this place. Get to work. No, I, I, I'm there to be a witness, so I'm going to take five minutes to pray. No, you're no, no, no. You actually, when you're working, you're not there to be praying. You're working for the boss, and you need to be a good steward of where God has you, and then you're going to get the promotion. You know, I... I when we started working, I, we learned it's, it's everything. You will be promoted if you apply the word of God. You'll be promoted. When I became a Christian and God was, into, God's still, transformation still happening in my life. There's areas that I'm still working that God is saying, come on, Virginia, we, we can do this. But I remember when it came to work ethic. And I had a work ethic before Jesus, but when I became a Christian, I was like, I learned. And my husband always said, wherever we go, his name is not going to be mocked. You're going to work so hard. It was a summer that we were in lack of finances, and my kids were little. He was working, and he was cleaning offices, and I was cleaning house during the day. And when I was doing the, those toilets, I would even get a toothbrush. No, on the top because it's disgusting, the bottom. But I want them to say like, hey, we're going to give her that. We're going to give her another day because she cleans so good. You know that we have never said like, oh, we're too good already to, to, to do those things. No, when God sees you already operating in faith because faith without works is dead, then he sees, oh, my God, I can do something with my daughter. I can do something with my son. I can open doors for him, for them because they're not lazy. And God calls lazy wickedness. Because you lazy, remember the, the parable, you lazy and wicked servant. I told her, I, I don't want to be known to be lazy. I don't want to be known to be wicked because we have what it takes to succeed. We have what it takes. If God has asked you to have your own company, you have what it takes. You know what it's called? Hard work. Oh, it's, yeah, it's called Jesus. No, yes, Jesus is with you. The Holy Spirit is with you. We read it that the same power that resurrected Jesus, it's inside of us. So we know that now you put into practice what we're learning. 
Oh, yes, come up. I want to jump in with you. You know, why, do, why are we teaching on this? Um, she already said it, the parable of the, of the lazy and wicked servant. The, this, this is Jesus explaining this. He says, man, if you would have just placed it in the bank, you would have got interest at least. God is interested in your interest. And the reason that we talk about this, um, when we say thinkers, when we're trying to say renew your mind, change the way you think so that you can change the way you live, the way you think right now is the same direction you're going right now. When you change, it brings glory to God. Every time you, you, you increase, people say, wow, man, how'd you do that? It brings glory to God. It brings honor to God. But when you're not willing to, to make a change, and, and you know what? Sometimes I think we sit in church and we probably, we're probably thinking something uh, just spiritual, like, yeah, I, just, I need to read my Bible more. No, yeah. the given should be read your Bible. Yeah. The given should be pray to God. The change that we're talking about, um, in addition to your spiritual transformation, yeah. right, because it starts from inside out, yeah. is also looking at your daily life and say, how can I expand my, my career? How can I expand my business? How can I expand my knowledge? How can I expand my, my increase of pay? How can I expand my skill set? How can I expand my talent? How can I expand? Like everything that God has placed in you, must expand we cannot be so comfortable and so stuck because if we do that then we're no we're no different than the lazy and wicked servant who did nothing just sat on his assured blessing and we get nowhere with that god invest in us so that we can increase for him amen and at the same time, he gets all the glory because when the people start looking at you, you talk different, you think different, you believe different, man, you smell different. And all of a sudden, people are just like, my God, I love it when people come and, and who haven't seen for, you know, two years, five years, eight years, ten years, like, man, Mauricio, you are just different. Good Lord. You know what it does? That brings glory to my God. And what did you do? I hang out with Jesus. Listen, if you were a disciple in the times of Jesus, you'd be stretched. What you're doing now would probably hurt your head if Jesus had even five minutes with us of what he would expect us to do. Because when Jesus expected his disciples to do something, it was always uncomfortable. Hey, go to the neighbor down there and go take his donkey. Dang. <laughs> what do you mean take... Like carjack his donkey, like. He was but, a gangster. But but, we, but what I mean, Jesus walks in the temple. He was so sick of the way the people thought. Mm -hmm. He walked into the church, and he started turning tables over. You know what? I pray that God would turn the tables of our head over. Yes. Like for real, because no longer are we. That's why people. That's why people. They, they, they church hop because when it gets too uncomfortable, it's just easier to go find something to be comfortable again. Yeah. It's time to stretch. And then, of course, then there's churches where you just, you're never challenged. And no one's up in your grill. <laughs> let, let, me, let me give you a scripture quickly. If you have anything to jump in, please go ahead, Beto, as well. Because I know I just jumped into yours. You don't mind? Oh, yeah. Good thing you're being changed in the yes. way you think. Do you see I love the that. fruit? <laughs> Look at this. Go in your Bibles because the media doesn't have this. Go in your Bibles quickly. Uh, and this is, listen, just so you know that, wow, you know what? Elevate Church just created, came up with a creative title called Thinkers. No, Jesus was the master plan of thinking. Okay, look, uh, are you there, Luke chapter 5? Go to verse 37, Luke chapter 5, verse 37. This is Jesus, okay, coming out of his mouth. He's talking about thinking. Mm -hmm. He says, and no one. Everybody say no one. No one. Say it again, no one. No one. No, like for real, get it. I want you to just think. Just say no one. No one. That means not even you. No one puts new wine into old wine skins. Right now, God's trying to bring something new into us. 
but some of us, we still old in the way we think. We haven't changed the way we think about something. We've been addressed. We've been pushed. We've been stretched. But have you ever noticed, like, if you're the person that someone is always having to talk to you, you got some old wine skin. <laughs> like, if someone's always like, ah. you have some old wine skin. And so Jesus starts talking about people that are just not willing to accept. He says, listen, change doesn't come for no one who is not willing to change. There's a difference between I want to change because everybody wants to change something. And then there's a difference with I will change, right? The will to change. I will change, not just I want to change. Man, I really want to change that about myself. I really want to change the way I think. I really want to change the way I live. But want is not enough. Will. Jesus said, not my will, but what? Your will be done. So want was not enough for Jesus. He had to will it. And then we, we receive salvation today, right? And so look, he says, so he says, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else. Everybody say, or else. or else. Man, check this out. All the new good stuff. Come on. The new job. The new raise, the new house, the new career, man, the new, the new level of skill, the new talent. Look at this. We'll burst. Mm -hmm. It's just, <laughs> that's why nothing ever works because it's not that God's not working. It's just that you're not working. God's like, I'm trying to do something new. And you're like, yeah, I want that. I want that. And then, <laughs> But you didn't will that. And she says, and so it'll burst the wineskins and be ever say spilled. And so whatever gets spilled gets spoiled. And so it all gets spilled, and the wineskins will be what? Ruined. And so what, what's he saying? He says, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. And so here's the reality. Go now to Isaiah 43 quickly, and I'm done. My wife can just jump back in there. Is that cool, babe? Yes. Isaiah 43, verse 18 says, And do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Ever say old. Behold, I will do a new thing, and now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And so God's like, listen, I'm willing to do all this for you so that you can make some change. But you just keep bursting. And so I really believe that in this season as we're all coming together, I want you to think, just think, what can I change right now? What can I do? You can't help others who don't change. You can only help you. You can only help you. What are you going to change? Like my wife, I love your message tonight. Like what are you practic practically going to do so that you can birth something spiritual? And, and you know what? I believe that when you start thinking that way, you'll start living that way. And change, real change will happen. But if there's always something with you, always something, all the same old conversation, the same old, th you're bursting. And so God tonight is saying, come on, let's put some new wine inside of you. And this time, we, you ain't going to burst. No more. We can only handle so much, and then we burst. It's been 20 years. I'm like, God, keep pouring in the new wine. Keep it up, God. Keep filling me up. Because I want to accomplish everything that God has for me. And so should you. You should want everything that God wants you to accomplish. Yes. Amen? Yes. All right. Awesome. Thank you, David. Do you see how much I'm changing? Um, do you know, I'm reminded, and we, we, we say it, like, if you're in children's ministry, you teach about the Israelites, right? 
and the Israelites were crying out for God, and they wanted to be free from slavery. They, they, they were crying out to God. For 430 years, they cried out to God, deliver us, deliver us, deliver us. Then God, in his mercy and his goodness, he, he sent them in and he delivered them. And we're not any different than the Israelites. Because they had a promise, and you and I have a promise. They had a journey to take, and you and I have a journey to take. They had to conquer and to fight, and we have to conquer and to fight. The problem is that they were stuck. And, and let me, let's go to the scripture. Exodus 13, 17 and 18 says this. When the king of Egypt let the people go, God did not take them by the road that goes up the coast of Philistia, although it was the shortest way. Listen to this. He says there was a shorter way to get to, to the promised land. But he says, I'm not going to take them that way. We're like, hello, it's the short way. Why would we need to take an 11-day journey when we could be six, right? But he says, I won't take them that way. I won't take them the shortest way. God thought. I got things. That's why I say, God thought. Mm, it's not good for them. This is what the Lord said, thought. I do not want the people to change their minds and return to Egypt when they see that they are going to have to fight. See, I want a promise, but why do I have to fight? He led them to the wilderness because he wanted them to succeed. God will never let you to a place, and even when God is leading you into your promise, there's going to be a season that is very painful. Because in that season, in the wilderness, there, he was trying to give them a new vision. He was trying to get, you know, we always said they came out of Egypt, but Egypt never came out of them. And he knew if they see conflict, oh, these are, these are going back to Egypt. But they, they have cried out, Lord, deliver us, these people. I mean, we know slavery, and even now, it's slavery is happening in our times. We as a church are fighting slavery because there's kids being slave right now as we're speaking. So that's still happening. And God cries out and people are crying out and you and I are the answer. So God answers to people when they cry out to him. So he answered and they cried out and now they're there. And they said, no, if they go through the shortest way, they're going to see the Philistines and they want to be out because it's going to be too much for them. Instead, he led them in a roundabout way through the desert toward the Red Sea. The Israelites were armed for battle. Do you know what that means? They were already ready. When God took them out of Egypt, everything that they needed in case they needed to fight, they were already armed to do so. Like they could have gone. They could have gone and taken the shorter way, but the God says, I know they're already equipped. I, they have everything to actually win the fight because I'm with them, but I already know that I just delivered them, but now they need to be set free from their mind. Because one thing is, is to be delivered. Do you know that salvation means deliverance? But another thing is to be free. Deliverance means someone can come and be on a... a be on a, on a jail cell and you come and then you, you come and you deliver them and you unlock, you break the lock and then you open the door. Hey, you are delivered. You're free to move. You're free to go. But see, we don't come out of those places. We are delivered because he already did, he did it. Jesus did it for us. But see, you and I, we still do that. If we are, are going to follow God, you need to know that when we follow God, there is going to be a season when God is, is trying to take out our past. There's a season that he wants you addressed with that past. That's why he took him the longer way so that whatever was inside of them, their past needed to come out, but they refused to let go of their past. They refused to. And if you read their entire story, whenever they got conflict, they murmur, they, they complain. They were thinking about when they ate fish. They didn't even get fish. No, 
they were, they were, they were slaves and they didn't have good food. But then in their mind, because it was so, so twisted and it was so, they were so accustomed to, to, to slavery in the way that they lived. That manna, when Jesus, when God sent manna, it wasn't enough for them. And they cried out to God and they said, God, provide for us. And then God sends provision. He sends manna. And manna had everything that they needed to, for nourishment, but they didn't want that. So I don't want, I don't want God to answer me like that. I want to I wanna eat the way that I used to eat when I was in the past. It was really hurtful, but you know, I was accustomed to that life. And God is telling you, that's what we need to, we need to. It's okay that there's going to be a season when you obey God and there's a promise of God and we're going to conquer. He will lead us into some wilderness. An 11-day journey. And if you study, the 11-day the journey was just to go from Egypt to the entrance of Jericho. That was the 11-day journey. But the conquering and the winning and taking possession was supposed to be two years. Two years. And, but they spent 40 years, not even conquering, they spent 40 years in their 11-day journey. And I multiplied it by 40 years. It's about 14,000 days and like 600 and something. That's not even adding leap year. And the entire time, they refused to change. They refuse to have conflict. They refuse and they refuse. And, and sometimes that's how we are. We, we, God gives us a promise. And, and believe me, don't we say that the promises are yes and amen? We made a song. The promises are yes and amen. And then. Yeah, but he also needs your yes. He needs your yes to be able to. To pass the mark and to enter and to fight. And when we see, when we see the battle is coming, he says, I don't want them. They already equipped. I don't want them to go back to how they defaulted before when, I, I, when they were in slavery. And, you know, I always thought, God, you know, like, I think I preached it once. Now that I'm thinking, right? This thinking has me thinking. I thought, I, I think I said it once, like, I said, when, when, you know, when Jesus says, in this life, you're going to have tribulations. If you're here, I think I say it every Wednesday. This life, you're going to have tribulations. It's going to be hard. And one day, I think I was preaching. I said, easy for you to say, Jesus. In this life, we're going to have tribulation. Yeah, because you're in heaven with the Father. I think I kind of say it with that attitude. And you know why he tells us that in this life, we're going to have tribulation, but he says, be of good courage because I overcome for you. I already overcame for you. And then I thought to myself this afternoon, because I always, you know, sometimes you're, I'm, I, I, ask, I still ask God, why, 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 why? And why just confuses you unless you go back to the word of God. And this is what I remember in Isaiah 53, 3 it says that Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Another translation says he was a man of sorrows, intimately familiar with suffering. He was intimately familiar with suffering. So that's why he can tell us, hey, be of good cheer. You think you're the only one suffering? No, he suffered for you and I. That's not even counting the cross. And he says he was acquainted with pain. Do you understand that? He was acquainted with betrayal. He was acquainted with disappointment. He was acquainted because he came as a man. He felt everything that you and I feel. So I want you to know that when he tells us that we can conquer, it's because he knows. When you're suffering, it is really hard to change because it is hard to change. It's painful, but I'd rather have the pain, as I say something, I'd rather have the pain of change than the pain of staying stuck in the same place. I think you spend more energy staying stuck than in change. And then, you know, it's okay to be acquainted with suffering. We only want to be acquainted with the resurrection of Jesus, but we don't want to acquaint be acquainted with his death. But there's places that need to die. There's places that we need to get rid of. There's places that we need to go and clean. There's places that God is saying, I want you to address that. Jesus said that in Galatians 5.1, I think it's Galatians 5.1. I don't know if I, if I gave it to, to the team, but he says that um, 
Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He says, stand fast in the liberty. We're asking God, you know, so many, the church right now, it's, 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 uh, it's very fragile. We're very fragile. Anything moves us. Conflict moves us. Fighting moves us. Very fragile. And God says, when I take you on the journey to your promised land, I don't want you to run. When you see that you're about to fight, when you see, hey, there is a battle ahead and, and I'm going to have to fight. I don't want you to go back to your Egypt. Do not go back to where he delivered you. And that takes, that takes great, great courage. It takes a great decision to say, I will not go back. I will not go back. You have to say, I refuse to go back. I refuse for the name of Jesus to be mocked in my life. I refuse, and you need to refuse, and you need to stand. He says, stand, therefore, in the liberty. That means you take ground. If we're going to advance the kingdom, it's not like, you know, I used to say like, you know, like achy, breaky dance, three steps back. and three. No, stop dancing the achy, breaky. No, no, no. Yeah, see, we're going to... Dance it, dance it forward. And dance it forward. Movement doesn't mean that a God is changing. We could be moving backwards, it's movement. But God wants us to move forward. And God wants us to be strong. We, we are able to be strong. You're able to fight for your family. You are able to do so. Stop waiting. Stop waiting for... For, for you or someone in your family to agree that we can and we are able to be restored. Start waiting for, for your children, if, for, for them to be free from addiction. You stand for them. You agree with them. Agree with him. And say yes to him. And when the enemy comes to lie, you go back to your yes. No, it's either yes or no. Yes, Jesus, you are going to do it. Because the enemy comes to talk and to yap, but then shut his mouth. Because we are able to do so. We are able to change. Yeah. And in closing, just three things. Um, the only reason, and I know there's many reasons, but I believe that one of the biggest reasons the Israelites never made it into the promised land. And, and it's interesting because I meet with many people. I meet with a lot of leaders with great potential. And it's been like that for 20 years. And the same thing that happened to the Israelites is the same thing that's happening to many people today. And that is that the Israelites did not feel that they needed to change. Most people, when you sit with them, I promise you, start being intentional, listen to them. When you start talking to them about the change, you can sense that they don't feel they need to change. They feel like everything is just fine. What do you mean? What are you talking about? And, and that, let me tell you something, that will kill you. Um, I, I give you that as a point, but I want to read you this real quickly because something practical. How many know this guy? I mean, barely anybody knows him, but this guy named Steve Jobs. Anybody ever heard of that guy? Yes. Okay, look, Steve Jobs once talked about the devastating loss of being outsted or fired from Apple. This is the man who created Apple, was fired by Apple. <laughs> An event that was influenced by toxic, ever say toxic? toxic? By toxic management style. I didn't see it then, Jobs said, but it turned out that getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. It was awful tasting medicine, but I guess the patient needed it. Getting fired from the company he loved was a crisis for jobs and he responded by addressing the issues that caused it so he finally looked internally said i need to make some changes he changed not because he wanted to but because he felt that he had to he had the crisis that had never occurred and if he would not have changed the rest wouldn't have happened so you have to feel that you need to change. You have to know it. You got to feel like, man, I, I do need some change. Also, you have to have the courage to face it. 
have the courage to face. Most people won't accept the fact that they need to change because they're afraid to admit it. So have the courage to face the fear. You're not who you think you are. We can all grow, amen? You can do this. You guys got this. Can I give you one more point? Stand to your feet. And this is my wife's. I'm just going to create one out of your point. I had a point. You have a point? One oh, point. get the point. No, get the point. <laughs> I mean, it's the same thing out of you preach. I'm just coming out with something That's from your I, preach. My point was to embrace suffering, to embrace. Okay, mine season. was close. Mine's, mine is you have to make the commitment to fight. Yeah. It's the same thing. Embrace yeah. it. Yeah. You have to make a commitment yeah. to fight for it. You can't. Listen, change is going to cause a struggle within you first. And then outside will be the next struggle. But it's like, it's like barriers. You, you break barriers along the way of life. You break them. You break habits. Habits in life cannot be changed unless you replace them with something else. And so God wants to put, pour new wine in you, but, but you, need, uh, you need a new wine skin. And so the new wine can't come until you can be a new skin. You need to be a new skin. You know what that also tells me? You better have some thick skin <laughs> if you're going to be a Christian. Don't let offense keep bursting you. Come on, don't let, uh, don't let a, a whining spirit burst you. Don't let, a, don't let a victim mentality burst you. And so we have to we have to we have to be different than the Israelites and and feel that hey, there's a need for change. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.